<laughs> I hope Mark is going to be mad at me. Good evening. Uh, I'm Lynn Chase, member of the library. Well, what a pleasure it is to welcome Bill back to the library. I think the last time he was here, we were celebrating his 90th birthday. So you're a regular now. <laughs> I love the word regular. <laughs> oh or as people say, your family. <laughs> well, it's a great pleasure to have him back. And as you know, he is one of America's most treasured poets. Ah, do come in. And also, one of our most prolific men of letters. Mr. Smith is the author of more than 50 books of poetry, children's verses, literary criticism, translations and memoirs, and editor of notable poetry anthologies. In the library, we have 16 William J. Smith books for your information. Um, Bill was an uh, early poet laureate of the United States, and he has been honored by uh, awards from the Swedish Academy, the Academy Française, and the Hungarian government for distinguished translations of their country's poetry. Two collections have been nominated for National Book Award, and he has also been nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature. Born in Louisiana in 1918, Mr. Smith attended Washington University and Columbia University, and during the Second World War, he served in the United States Navy as liaison officer on a French frigate in the Atlantic and the Pacific. In 1947, he won the Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford, and he has taught and lectured in many parts of the world. Bill Smith served in that much coveted and influential post, chairman of the writing division at Columbia University, and in addition as poet in residence at Williams College, as well as professor emeritus of English at Hollins University. In 1975, he received that ultimate American honor election to the American Academy of Arts and Letters, which appointed him Vice President for Literature. Bill and his wife, Sonia Hausman, a well-known, uh, Sonia is well-known in the literary world as a translator, um, and I'm happy to say she's with us this evening. Um, they spend part of each year in their Paris apartment and part in Cummington, Massachusetts, in their wonderful old house, high on a hill, surrounded by forests, which once belonged to another important American poet, William Cullen Bryant. Bill Smith's work actually embodies the history of American poetry over the last seven decades. Speaking of his book, The Cherokee Lottery, the famous dean of literary critics, Harold Bloom, commented that Smith writes poetry of epic proportions. Bill had an Indian, American Indian ancestor, his great great Grandfather was Chief Mosh Mosh Toby. Mosh Toby, who um, he's the one who led the Choctaw Nation into exile 
in Oklahoma. The writer Paul Thoreau speaks of Bill's The Cherokee Lottery as the best account of that American tragedy, the historic Trail of Tears, as not only a great poem, but a work of history and drama as well. The American Poets' Corner at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine has been honored by William J. Smith's service as poet in residence, which has been tremendously influential in the Poets' Corner becoming an international place of pilgrimage in New York and a ceremonial gathering place for America's leading poets and writers. Well, there is so much to say about William J. Smith's life and work. Oh, in addition to everything else, he was once he once served uh, in the in a state legislature, the only poet who ever did, and it was Vermont. As a Democrat. <laughs> The only one at the time. <laughs> <laughs> now we shall hear from the poet himself about his friendship with another uh, major American literary figure, Tennessee Williams. No. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, you know, I'm sure that many of you have been to the. Poets' Corner. Uh, you can't stay here? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think we want to concentrate on it here. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Lynn. Uh, but the, um, some of you have heard of the, uh, of the Poets' Corner in the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. But the one thing that, <coughs> that Lynn Chase did not say about that is it would not have existed without her. <clears throat> it was her idea in the first place, and uh, she was, uh, she has, is responsible for his, his great activity over the years. And it's there that I met her, and I wish that I had, could spend the time tonight to talk about everything that she's done for poetry in the United States, and how many corners, poets' corners there are that uh, owe so much to her. And uh, this, uh, I would go, uh, is <coughs> my <coughs> last reading here, and I want to dedicate it very much to Lynn Chase. <laughs> Uh, when Tennessee Williams uh, first became known as Tennessee Williams was with the success of the Glass Menagerie. And uh, when that became a success, uh, he gave my name to anybody who was interested in learning what his, what his life was like before he became famous. Uh, well, it was, uh, I, so I, over the years I've spoken to uh, I don't know how many people in how many countries and uh, about this subject. But I'm going to, uh, to talk about this in, in general and read you a little bit tonight because the one thing that I, I can say, and I think I can speak better than anybody has, and that is I knew him first before he'd written any long plays. I also knew him as a poet all of his life. And I, I'm very happy to say that in this book, which is one of the most handsome books that I've had published in 65 years of publishing, and it is a, 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 by the University Press of Mississippi, uh, and it, it's uh, a, a, a book that I think that he would have himself been proud to see. And I'm so pleased that it's the first book 
as several critics have already pointed out, that really speak of him not just as a playwright, but as a poet and a playwright. And the two go together, very much so. And this is what uh, I think uh, that I've tried to do in this book. And uh, I'm, I think well, I'm giving some idea uh, tonight of that uh, direction of, of the book and also of the, what he achieved by writing in, uh, in his work, which was always, he felt, and those of us who knew him early on felt, was a poet as first and foremost, he was first and foremost a poet. Um, I, uh, I'm going to pause to, uh, uh, to apologize for the, uh, the pollen in the air, which uh, makes me drip. And so I feel like a, a drain pipe here. And I may have to sniffle all half the way through here, but I'm going to try to make it. Uh, and uh, I, I will, that's the last uh, apology I'll make. I, I, will, um, I was so uh, delighted to see this poem that was this, uh, that is printed here uh, because it's, it's one that I think must have been written just about the time when we first met in 1935. But it's certainly during that period. Um, and perhaps I should uh, begin by reading it, uh, because it, it shows all of the strength of his work. We have not long to love. We have not long to love. Light does not stay. The tender things are those we fold away. Coarse fabric are the ones for common wear. In silence, I have watched you comb your hair. Intimate the silence, dim and warm. I could, but did not reach to touch your arm. I could, but do not break what which was still. Almost the faintest whisper would be shrill. So moments pass as though they wish to stay. We have not long to love a night, a day. And of course, I recognize uh, in, in, in this, as in many things that he's written, how much I stole. Which is all about uh, uh, a woman in silence combing her hair. And uh, I, I didn't realize that that, that also been taken from him. Uh, I'm going to read uh, just the little bit of the opening of this book. Uh, and uh, the comment as I go along, if you will uh, allow me to do that. Uh, Tennessee Williams spent his first seven years in Mississippi, but the rest of his life, Missouri and the city of St. Louis, where he now lies buried, were the, for the most part, physically or imaginatively, his residence. I was a close associate of, of his there from 1935 to 1940, when we were both students. I, a freshman, and he, a senior, at Washington University. Actually, he'd already been for three years to the University of Missouri, where he had uh, thought that he would take a degree in journalism. But in the third year, uh, this was the time of the Great Depression, and uh, his parent, his father, who uh, didn't uh, have, was, was pretty, he was in very good position, actually. He was a, uh, uh, in charge of, the, he was a sales uh, manager at one of the biggest shoe companies in, you know, in the United States and in St. Louis at the time. Actually, I'm wearing shoes that were <laughs> hush puppies that were, uh, at that time, manufactured in that St. Louis factory. Uh, but um, now every time I start to do something like that, I lose it. I start to ramble and I shouldn't do that. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't know where I was at, but I was 
was talking about. You were in St. Louis. I was yeah. in there. I was in, in uh, the University of Missouri. The, the University oh, yeah. of Missouri, yes, I'm sorry. At uh, the University of Missouri, where he went for three years, where his father uh, didn't approve of uh, his failing uh, uh, ROTC, which was required, and so brought him back to St. Louis. And he had made him work in a shoe factory for these shoes. And he then he uh, succeeded in uh, writing poems, as you must know, on the backs of shoe boxes and so forth, but also managed to have a nervous breakdown. And so then he was allowed to come to Washington University and concentrate on getting a degree there, which he did. Finally, he couldn't manage to do that because he was concentrating on his plays. But then he went, of course, at the end of the a uh, couple of years at, in Missouri uh, with when, when I and we were to, to together. Then he went to Iowa and did get a degree and then went on to his uh, plays. But there were three of us uh, there uh, uh, in a, 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 uh, also Clark Mills was also a university senior and Clark at that time was one of the first, the poet to <coughs> throughout the country. And uh, we met the uh, <coughs> poet playwright, Tom, frequently as often as three times a week at his house on Pershing Avenue, a few blocks from the campus. We read our poems to one another, feeling as true poets do, that poetry must be heard before it can be committed to the page, or certainly to the stage. And when not reading, in his living room, I looked and listened, and thus got to know Tom well, and became familiar with all the sights and sounds that he confronted every day and night, and in that household that he depicted so forcefully in the glass menagerie, and to which in his other In, his, in, in which his imagination he returned throughout his life in all the other plays and poems and stories he created. I remember his indomitable mother, Edwina, ushering us like some contented commanding Confederate general to an antebellum mansion with the honey coated, steady, monotonous, and maddeningly unstoppable voice that Loretta Taylor, in the character of Amanda Wingfield, caught perfectly. The madness in her speech that extended out over the entire household that she dominated was echoed from time to time in her talented son's dark, down-home delta drawl, cut by the cool blades of gallows humor it erupted in uncontrollable laughter that resounded along the shelves on either side of the fireplace and shook dust from the books they contained. I carry with me the vision of that lonely, lovely, forever lost Sister Rose, drifting in from the shadows, her shrill, persecuted voice ruffling the air and rippling her beaded blouse as she flees the determined drumbeat of the heavy, stylishly footed, hard drinking salesman father Cornelius. And Rose, of course, is the one who at this very time, in 1937, uh, was uh, analyzed as being schizophrenic. And uh, I'll turn this in one of the poems that I've chosen to quote for you. And unfortunately, uh, at the time, but I knew her then and saw her all as she drifted in, as I say, from the shadows. Uh, Tom also went to see her in the, uh, uh, the uh, Warmington uh, uh, hospital where she was, uh, a certain distance from St. Louis. And he wrote uh, uh, poems, but it was not, that was in 1937, but it was not until 1943 
but she was one of the first to have the prefrontal lobotomy, which would be what a menis, uh, 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 this operation was a, performed at that time in Bowen's Hospital, which was one of the great hospitals of the country and of the world, as a matter of fact. And this was thought at the time to be one of the great uh, helps for schizophrenia. Of course, it was not. It's never done now. And it's the last thing in the world to do because you simply take out a section of the brain and, and leave a vegetable. And uh, this was unfortunately. And, uh, uh, Tom did not give his consent to his mother doing this, and he never forgave her for doing it. Of course, she was, she was getting the best advice in the world at the time from the Barnes Hospital. And then up behind the uh, Cornelius, this time, uh, uh, marches the skinny, uniformed, little busy-bodied brother, David, back from his ROTC training session in the field house of the university. Uh, Dakin was a, a very, very good at ROTC, <coughs> which his brother pumped. <laughs> I want to record the continuing presence in my mind of Tom's family members who appear in one form or another in almost every work, and his two early influential friends, Clark Mills, who was known then, uh, he was, his full name was Clark Mills McBurney, uh, but he was one of the poets uh, that was really best known in the country. Uh, and uh, he was uh, one who had been in an, appeared in an, 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 an anthology called Time Balances, uh, which was uh, edited by, <coughs> Uh, a woman uh, named Winslow from uh, the University of Idaho, of all places. But anyway, she organized the uh, a Poets uh, Society, Poetry Society of America. And we all, and this was on every university campus. And uh, Tom had been a member of this at, at U of Missouri, and we all became members of this at Washington University. But because Tom felt that the three of us were the only ones really interested in writing, we should meet more regularly than the regular meetings of the Poetry Society. And we met at his house uh, near the campus. Um, but Clark was one of the great uh, uh, influences of the period on, on Tom. Uh, because he, uh, as he mentions in his memoirs, he says that uh, uh, Clark, uh, he admired Clark's work, and uh, Clark was the one who showed him, uh, introduced him to poets like uh, Luca and, uh, <coughs> and, and, and uh, many others. Um, I wish to call back the riverfront of St. Louis as it was then was during the Great Depression, with the Hooverville shacks on the edge of the Mississippi, there below Eads Bridge, as important to Tom as Brooklyn Bridge had been to Hart Crane, one of the poets that he was introduced to by Clark at this time, and to provide some sense of the entire fog-bound, polluted city that he examined so carefully and to which he gave literary permanence. Uh, he says, of course, in his memoirs, have I told you that at the Washington University we had a little poetry club. It contained only three male members. The rest were girls, pretty, with families who owned elegant houses in the country. <laughs> and this is, uh, he's, and of course he, uh, in his memoirs, he says these three male poets uh, and were, uh, were uh, in the, uh, in, uh, how does he put it now, uh, in, uh, were uh, Clark Mills, William 
J. Smith and himself, and it says that's in, in, the, in order of talent, <laughs> uh, which is ridiculous because it should be completely the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that was one of the, he had a great sense of humor. Anyway, I'm not going to, I'm going to skip along now, uh, and skip till the, one of the uh, scenes in, in the household which leads to, uh, to, to a poem. And that was uh, this, which I will read. We knew something about Tom's sister Rose, but we rarely saw her when she came to the house. We were aware that she was undergoing treatment for her mental condition, though we did not know, and even Tom himself did not then know, how very serious that condition was, and how in a few years later she would undergo a prefrontal lobotomy. On one occasion, when his parents were away on a holiday in the Ozarks, Tom invited Clark and me and another friend, Willie Horton, to share some whiskey with him. Clark had known Wharton at the university and found him amusing. I did not. <laughs> he had little to say that was of any interest, and he never stopped talking. <laughs> at the time, he was married to Minerva Prim, a former debutante, who stayed at home with their little baby Wharton would take us up there to their apartment and seem to enjoy having us listen to their interminable, uninteresting, and interminable arguments. I saw him years later, much subdued and married to a nurse who appeared to be able to manage him better than Minerva had. <laughs> the evening at Tom's, after several drinks, Willie began making obscene telephone calls to people whose names he had picked at random from the phone book. <laughs> you know that lovely little game that we all used to play as kids, but he was, he was grown up, of course. I have a vision in my memory of Rose appearing suddenly on the stairs in a fluffy white dress and outraged, threatening to tell her parents when they returned about what was happening. This she did to Tom's great distress. After she had tattled tight, on my wild party, the playwright later recounted in his memoirs, when I was told I could no longer entertain my first group of friends in the house, I went down the stairs as Rose was coming up them. We passed each other on the landing, and I turned upon her like a wild cat and hissed at her. I hate the sight of your ugly old face. Wordless, stricken, and cow crouching, she stood there, motionless, as in a corner of the landing, as I rushed out, as I rushed out, out of the house. This was the cruelest thing I have done in my life, I suspect, and one for which I could never properly atone. I'd like now to, uh, to turn immediately to a, a poem, uh, because this was one which was written at this uh, very time. And uh, it's a very strong poem, I think you will agree. Uh, I'll read it first, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. The Beanstalk Country. You know how mad how the mad come into a room, so too boldly, their eyes exploding on the air like roses, their entrances from space we never entered. They're always attended by someone small and friendly who goes between us, between their awful world and ours, as though explaining, but really only smiling, a snowy gull that dips above a wreck. They see not us, nor any Sunday caller, among the geraniums and wicker chairs, 
for they are jacks who climb the beanstalk country, a place of hammers and tremendous beams compared to which the glassed solarium in which we rise to greet them has no light. The news we bring them, common, reassuring, drenched with the cheerful idiocy of noon, cannot compete with what they have to tell of what they saw through cracks in the ogre's oven. And we draw back, the snowy someone says, don't mind their talk, they are disturbed today. In uh, several of his plays, um, um, Tom makes reference to this, uh, and I will give you uh, from one unpublished poem uh, these lines. When I was a boy in the country between two rivers, I lived on the margin of something not public domain. I never went into, but always was ready to enter, the beanstalk country, where unseen presences are. And I think so much of what he wrote was about those unseen presences, which, which were presences uh, which were both beautiful and horrible, and the presences of the imagination. I would like to work. I could go on talking for the rest of the night about uh, the uh, poems in the, in the book. Uh, the, of course, every, uh, every play is full from beginning to end with, with every kind of poetry. He has, if you will go through and look at any play, you have little couplets, quatrains, Stanzas, whole, uh, uh, whole, uh, wonder, all kinds of nonsense as you have in Shakespeare, uh, limericks, all of this. But very often <clears throat> he has written all of these poems before and just brings them in uh, as if he, the way he does with his plays. At this time, when he wrote this beautiful, uh, terrible poem. I mean, terrible in the sense of horrible, about a horrible subject. He was also writing his first full-length plays. And uh, when, when we, Clark and I went to see the first one, Candles to the Sun, on 1937. And we were both, we had heard him read other plays. Uh, in fact, there's one called Ishtar, which, is a, called, uh, which takes place in the Babylonian well, it's really, uh, of the, it's absolutely horrible writing, and uh, I quote just a few lines from it in the book, which are, I won't give you now, but uh, they were, uh, it, when we burst out laughing and we listened to this, uh, he was, instead of being just shaken and practically in tears, he laughed with us, and I promised to, to tear it all, but of course he never uh, destroyed anything, so that uh, the complete edition of that is now available, uh, and it's a, it's a real uh, it's it's a very interesting thing to read because uh, although it's it's about a love affair, it has some beautiful uh, passages that are not so beautifully stated, but are are, are very much one can see what he was going to do with something of this sort, dramatically. Uh, anyway, when we went this night to see this first full-length play, The Candles, the Candles of the Sun, which is about uh, miners uh, in uh, Alabama, and uh, this is a subject which, uh, which I had uh, heard about and written about in written in newspapers. And, uh, we thought, well, you know, he, he would try to write something about this and it might be an interesting thing to do. But we were, both of us, unprepared for what was real poetry on the stage. And it was, <clears throat> it was incredible 
that they, we felt in this subject, which certainly didn't seem to lend itself to poetry, that what the, there was such a rhythm in the speech, which was that because his ear was so good that he was simply giving the, the clear and, and with the actual accent used in the Alabama coal miners talk. And so if you go and look at that play, which is now available in print in by New Directions, actually I have written an introduction to it, and in that introduction I mentioned the fact that even there's poetry in every line of, the, of, of some of the most dramatic scenes, and even in the, uh, in the stage directions, there are, are, they, they could be cast on a page as a poem. So and then uh, this was the fact that he, of course, pointed out later that there was poetry in everything that he touched on. I read another poem, another old poem, which was written at about the same time, and this is uh, one that I'm going to conclude with, and we, we, uh, we're happy to take some questions afterwards. Uh, and this is called Kitchen Door Blues, and it's a poem that Tom wrote about the same time he was working on the Glass Menagerie. It may have been part of a project projected Negro libretto are one of the blues songs he promised to write for Libby Holman. When late in his life, I asked permission to reprint the poem in an anthology. Tom told me that of all his works, it was the one his father liked best. One can understand why the father must have felt that he himself was speaking. My old lady died of a common cold. She smoked cigars and was 90 years old. She was thin as paper and the ribs of a kite, and she flew out the kitchen door one night. Now, I'm no younger than the old lady was when she lost gravitation and I smoked cigars. I look sort of peaked and I feel kind of poor. So for God's sake, lock that kitchen door. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I'll pause and let you ask you questions. Yes. Uh, how did, do you know how he made a transition from being a poet to a playwright? Why he decided to become a playwright? Uh, well, he was he was doing actually he was doing all sorts of things at the same time, and uh, I think that he uh, he really knew that uh, that he had uh, he he felt he had to get out of, uh, of his basic situation. I mean, he, he blamed it all on St. Louis, but of course the basic problem was the family right around it. He had to get away from. It. And he would do anything, and he would. Uh, he thought that he would can only do it because he could only. The only thing he really could do was write. So he was writing everything, and he sent off every day and every every uh, you know he, every the things that would come back right away, or sometimes they were published. Every kind of thing you can think of. Now he did even uh, write plays at, in, that were in uh, during the time in. The University of Missouri, but they were not long plays. And we call them all always fantasies. And I think that he uh, he planned to go on uh, writing, uh, but I think it was the the fact of the uh, when he saw when he got real encouragement there for the first time in St. Louis by Willard Holland. That's when he decided, I think, that this was what he. Well, also, I went with him once, and this is mentioned in the, uh, in the book, to see Nazimova in Ghosts, the great Russian actress who was touring the country. And uh, he was so stunned by, the, by this uh, magnificent acting that he said, uh, you know, that he wanted this is when he decided 
he wanted to marry for the stage. And uh, then, of course, I think that, it, they, well, of course, also when he started to do it, he realized that he certainly could not make any money from poetry, and he was going to try to make it for, uh, by, by, by writing for the stage. And of course, the, the, his initial failure, which was uh, the, the uh, Battle of Angels in Boston, which I also saw because it went, I, I was studying as a majoring in French, getting a master's degree in French, and the, uh, the uh, uh, National, uh, whatever it's called, the Society of Professors was going to re-meet there, so I, I went to try to get a job to avoid the draft, uh, and, and, but uh, that didn't work anyway. But I was there the night it opened, and the night it failed in Boston. But, uh, and Matt thought he, he was, thought he was finished, but he didn't manage to go on, and then he managed to write the grass manager. So I think there was some other questions. Yes? You said you met him in 1935. Yes. Uh, you were about 17 then. Were you in high school or college or, you know? What I was? Yeah. Well, I was in just a, a freshman college. Sorry, yes. And uh, then uh, I, I saw him all that time, but up until the, the time of coming off the war. That's, uh, and uh, I went, uh, I did go one, uh, one year, he went away to uh, New Orleans and, uh, and, and then he went off across the country and came back and we were together another year there. And, uh, but it was, uh, he was seven years older than I was. And he says at one point uh, that I was the kid who, and uh, when well, I discovered after he died that he describes a scene where he went to my, my room in the, in the, uh, uh, the university and he was working on a, on a play and I was working on a bunch of poems and he, he said, said, well, you know, that some of, some of his poems, some of my poems were, were pretty good. I had very good lines, but some of them were, I had a terrible went off. And, but still, Bill is a nice kid, and someday <laughs> we'll make some kind marks above my grave. So I have a, a nice thing to say. And so, uh, actually, uh, uh, the strange thing was that uh, uh, he, he wasn't saying very much good about my poems then, but he did praise them in other times, and, and uh, in fact, think they thought the world of them. And then when we got to know each other over the years, he always felt that he was not appreciated as a poet. And uh, even even up till the end, he couldn't believe that people would really come and come to hear him read his poems, uh, which which they did. They all got up. And then he would he would refer to me uh, when I was at Columbia University as said I was a prominent poet of teaching an impossible subject, you know, teaching people to write, which of course was absolutely true. But when he was said, referred to me as a prominent poet, he said that about everybody that, that, that were part of the world who were, were getting printed as poets when, and paid it, and listened to as poets, or paid attention to as poets anyway. Uh, but uh, he felt that he was not. And uh, he would, uh, and even after the end, he didn't believe it. Yes, Lynn? Um, so you mentioned that um, he was very affected by the Nisimova right. uh, play. He was played in St. Louis. Right. Mm -hmm. But this was the period of the Works Progress Administration, right. wasn't it? So I wonder if he could have seen WPA plays in, as a Middle Westerner myself, I remember that it was a very unusual thing when we saw a play. Yes, Symphony, indeed. yes, but right. plays, no. No, uh, uh, of course, when he went off to, uh, uh, to New Orleans, he, he tried uh, to, to write something for the WPA players, and didn't, I think uh, they were, 
interested, but I didn't pay. But of course, he did see some plays then. But uh, we didn't see we didn't see much. There wasn't very much, except that this was there was a great one great theater in St. Louis. We had we had a symphony the way you did in uh, in Kansas City, but uh, we had uh, uh, and it was a very fine. And we did have one wonderful theater, the American Theater, and this is where Des Inglewood came, and also uh, other other uh, other play, other players. Uh, I mean, great uh, performers. Uh, but uh, so that was uh, it was you know it was very rare to get uh, uh, to hear hear suddenly plays by young people. I mean, yeah. He finally had. One play, short play taken uh, uh, by the uh, Webster players, that's in, in was Webster Groves, Mississippi, when the you know, outside of St. Louis. Yes. Yes. Did he publish books and poems? Did he publish books of poems? He did. Well, he did uh, that. Uh, in uh, the, it's called the. Uh, he came out, well, he was first published by New Directions, uh, along with other poets. Uh, and uh, this is this is why where, uh, James Laughlin read some of his poems and thought that he was a very talented poet. He said, I want to, I want to print. And he also had seen some of his plays. He said, I would like to print you and, uh, and for the rest of your life, if you care. So that, that's what happened. And this is what, why New Directions goes on today, even today, printing him. So he did, uh, and there was one book that was actually he, he put, he put together. But uh, as uh, was always his, his fate, it was, it was, he, didn't, uh, he didn't really listen to sound advice about what he should put together. And so it was not the best book. And of course, it was interesting, all the same. And, but it was given to one of the worst poets in the country uh, to, to review. And uh, we found out that this was uh, some, written by somebody who was making money in the theater. And so it was absolutely a, a hatchet job of reviewing. You know. Who reviewed it? Pardon? Who was the poet? <laughs> uh, I, well, fortunately, I cannot remember this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but I do, I do know that, that uh, I can tell you one, that Randall Gerald, who was not, uh, he was a, 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 a very respected poet, and he dismissed the book, uh, just dismissed it, but he didn't, he didn't, it was not a bad, you. It's just, uh, it was, you know, sort of say whatever uh, one would have said about this because it was certainly, uh, it was certainly bad uh, if you looked at the whole thing. Because if you wanted to look in between the poems of her, you would find something of real talent there. Uh, yes? I have to stand up again, see if I can. Was his, uh, as long as you knew him, was his personality day to day? excitable and exaggerated like the characters in his plays are? Or did he have moments of quiet and, I mean, what was his personality like, daily personality? Oh, uh, well, I, when I first met him, and I've written about in the book, and I've said that he was one of the shyest, quietest people I've ever met. And he would sit uh, for hours in a we're gathering of people and not, never say a word. Uh, and uh, then uh, suddenly, for some reason, uh, if somebody, I, and some, it was not always because of somebody had said something funny, but he just burst out with a great cackle <laughs> of laughing. And uh, this, uh, well, I thought at first that this was a little strange, <laughs> more than strange, uh, but, but uh, this was simply the way he was. And, and even, even so, he, of course, later he became, uh, when he started drinking and uh, with drugs, he, he was, 
he would, he, he would certainly uh, be very different. Well, I mean, we'd have a different public personality. I mean, he simply was uh, not afraid of anything. And he would say anything that came in his head. And uh, but, uh, uh, he was, well, you know, people heard him in that. No, some of you perhaps have heard him uh, on, say, the Dick Cabot show and that kind of thing, but he's, he was, uh, he would, uh, we would make fun of himself and all kinds of Thank you. But, uh, but I think actually that uh, whenever I saw him, even in later years after when he was drinking in with the Academy, uh, he would, uh, he would be again the person that I, I that I knew when we were first together. Any? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, Bill, would you read another poem or two of his if you have some favorites handy? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I. All right. Yeah. It seemed infinity to, with to, I'm sorry. It seemed infinity to him with eagles crying in the dawn. If importunately then he dreamed of lands forever leading on. A boundless continent was this, the early morning of the mind, but evening heard a serpent hiss of moth or moth wings fluttering the blind. And presently, the pilgrim turned, exhausted, toward the nearest gate, and, as a final lesson, learned that even death could make him wait. Then this is a, uh, a longer poem that uh, that was never published in his lifetime. And this is called A Big Storm. A big storm blew the wires down, so I ran screaming through the town. Unclean, unclean, and rang my bell, the lepers wear, to say, not well. And when my tongue is blown away, if there is more, I want to say, I have an eyeball that can stare in a tuft of sun-bleached hair, with which I'll make a flag to wave upon a staff of splintered bone. I'll wave it in a field alone as if to signal all unknown the, that people laugh at, of whom, at whom they stare, all shouting, scarecrows, skinny, bare, as buildings blasted, crying, dumb, Cassandra's played by Thomas Thumb. <laughs> It was, it was, this was the time when Rachel Lindsay was writing that sort of poem, but this is much his own touch of, of the untouchable, you know, and the, the pitiable, the creatures that he, did, on whom he, he felt, for whom he felt compassion. Okay. Well, perhaps there's no uh, better way to end our evening with those two lovely readings. Um, I want to thank you all for coming, and I definitely want to thank uh, Mrs. Chase for underwriting this evening's event with Mr. Smith. Uh, this has been really special. I hope you can stay for some more wine, uh, Pellegrino.
help us eat up the food. We'd like you to stay around. Uh, but I would like to also put in a, a plug for Friday evening. We're having a second event this week as part of our National Poetry Month celebrations. And we're having three New York-based uh, poets, Jan Grossman, Louis Phillips, and David Gezi. And I do suggest you come back Friday evening. It's at 6 o'clock for refreshments once again. And the readings will start at 6.30 and it should be a lovely evening. We do have books for sale, and we'd be happy to have you buy one to support the library and to support Mr. Smith. And uh, he'll be happy to sign for you here at the front of the members' room. So thank you all for coming.